Well, a dramatic Caterham Road Sports race there then, and that problem there for Tom Cockerell could prove to have some real championship ramifications as we move into the final part now of the 2021 Caterham Motorsport season. Uh, the same is true of the Caterham Academy Championships, both the white and green group out racing here today. The white group, in fact, are the next cars due out on circuit. They've got just three races left in the championship, one today and two next time out at the Snetterton finale, and it couldn't be much more finely poised in the championship. It's William James that's got the points advantage by just one point, though, and he is not here this weekend. So this will have to become uh, his drop score for the round. That then opens up the door for Harry George and Charlie Lauer, who are not that far behind him in the points. George, as I said, just one point behind him to try and take some points out of him. And those two are starting on the front row of the grid. It's set to be a really exciting race, this one. Scott, over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. Yes, our next Cajun match is just about to get underway very shortly with the first of our two races for the Love Cars Cajun Academy, which is our, our least experienced and our least experienced rookie drivers on the grid. And the first of our two groups, as there are so many that sign up for each year's academy, they have to split them across into two groups and therefore two separate championships within. So the first of which is going to be the white group who will be in action here this afternoon. And of course, we're going through their grid very, very shortly. So, just to reiterate for those who are in the academy, uh, the Kedgem Academy essentially is a series that is only for uh, rookie drivers only. You can't have ever held a competitive racing license before you join the Kedgem Academy. The whole package is around about uh, circa £30,000, but you get the race car, you get all your race entries, you also get your uh, track and test days and your drift days and handling days all thrown into that as well. And then when you start the season, when you get your arts test, as everyone does in the, in the, in the academy together, they do their, their arts test together to get their racing license. They then do group test days and track days, and then to start the season, they will start them off at a sprint at places like Kerbera or Aintree to get themselves ready for competitive action. Then once that's out of the way, then they get them onto the circuits, and they've raced so far this year at some great circuits, such as the likes of... Uh, I think Donington, uh, uh, Donington Park, it's been Mallory Park to start their season. Not killing Scotland was one of them as well. They've also been to the likes of Brands Hatch and, and uh, Brands Hatch. Silverstone also on the Grand Prix circuit was quite an experience for them. Now they come to Croft this weekend for their first taste of a North Yorkshire circuit, which should be quite intense. And Andy McKeown, you've been doing a lot of running around this afternoon, so it's good to have you back in the <laughs> back, in, back in the seat with the commentary box. Um, this is a special moment for these guys, of course. Every time they visit a new circuit, it's always a brand new experience for them. They're going into the unknown. And that's what makes it so exciting and fascinating for them to go into a new circuit, to learn the nuances of what cross circuit's about. And for them, it's all vital education for their next few seasons going into cage racing, should they choose to continue into Road Sport 270 and 310R. Because what they learn here, they're going to take with them for the next three or four or five seasons in cage racing. And then beyond that, they move on to other races at further afield, such as high levels of racing or other championships within club racing itself. It's, it's a very vital championship in many cases. I call it the Formula 4 of sports cars. He's got lots of similarities between that and the single seat championship. Lots of similarities in terms of how it teaches car control, all sorts. It's a really special championship for those who've never raced before, and it really does bring in some fantastic young drivers, well, various age of drivers, of very experienced levels when they, once they finish. Yeah, I mean, this is, for most of these drivers, their sixth ever motor race that they're about to go into. They really are learning right in front of our eyes. And I, I find that fascinating. I love watching uh, junior categories of racing for the same reason, because you really see drivers coming on stronger as the year goes on, and there will be some that take to it really quickly, and they're bang on the pace right at the start of the season. And then there are others that maybe take two or three races just to sort of get to grips with the car, building confidence, get stuck in a bit more, and then they start to score the points as the season goes on. Uh, case in point is Charlie Lowe, who is third in points uh, here coming into this uh, weekend, started off the season really well with a win, but well, that was in a sprint, and then as far as the races were concerned, it took him until Silverstone two races ago to get his next victory of the season. So Charlie uh, is clearly getting faster as we go into the 2021 season, and there are others as well who have just now started to challenge for podiums and top fives as we get deeper into the uh, campaign. So I love watching their progress uh, and racing here at Croft. I'm sure they're going to learn an awful lot because it's a really challenging, bumpy, unforgiving circuit the likes of which arguably they haven't really raced at so far. Yes, Knock Hill, where they raced twice earlier on this year, that's definitely a challenge. Uh, but this one, uh, a much more high-speed circuit, really. So this is something new, I think, for all of them. So what else you can love as well? Um, on main scores, William James leads the way with 141 points. One ahead of Harry George, 140, and then 136 for Charlie Lower. On drop scores, all three are tied on 97 points each. So that makes it even more intense, of course, because drop, when drop scores come into play, it makes that little bit more 
there's a bit more mass, a bit more calculations to get involved, and the strategy of kind of picking the results and making sure that you get the results that you need is very crucial, particularly when you get to the latter end of the season, like you're coming here, when quite literally every single point has to count and is crucial. And of course, in some cases, if you have to rely on your drop scores, you have to hope that the results that you've got throughout the season as you get towards the top top end of the sea, of the year in the final few races, you have to hope the results that you've got through the year are good enough to carry you if you, if you need to rely on them. Otherwise, some drivers drop le have to only gain back less points than they could do if they get worse results towards the end. And that can really hamper the chance of some drivers and can literally be, the, be a point or two difference between winning the championship and missing out and being second or third. It really is that close. No, it absolutely is. And what's interesting is that William James, the championship leader, I don't think is here this weekend, is it? So this will now become his dropped score. Now... OK, he, he can fall back on that drop score, of course he can, but it means he can't now at Snetterton next time at the finale afford to have a bad race. So Harry George and Charlie Lower, they really need to score big in this race. And also uh, Giles Perry, who's not a million miles back in the championship, if they can score really well, if any one of them can win this race, really put some pressure on William when he makes his return, we presume, at uh, Snetterton next time out. Absolutely. Uh, last couple of cars getting in position. Quick run down the first few rows. Harry George will start on pole with Charlie Lower alongside him. Giles Perry and Gareth Lucas are next on the second row. Then Tom Noakes and Mike Banton from Benja Headley and Mark Janiszewski. And Simon Patel and James Moon round out the top ten. And just in time as the green flag flies. And we're all set to see some of our rookie drivers within the cage room ranks get underway. The penultimate round of the 2021 Love Cars Cage Room Academy White Group Championship all set to get underway. One more race before the finale at Sneston in October. Who can take the top spot and the maximum points? Red lights are on. Who can win the sprint towards turn one? Well, let's find out. Decent start for the first couple of rows. It looks like the Harry George from pole position has managed to get himself away pretty cleanly as they head down towards turn one for the first time. 20 minutes of racing for the Cation Academy in towards Clairvaux for the first time. And it will be by the looks of things. Harry George that leads it then. The rest of Clark Hilgers piling through. One or two drivers going a little bit wide, as you'd expect with these rookie drivers. They're turning through the right couple of corners. Oh dear, a couple of bit, two cars in contact. 67 and 74 involved. So 67 is uh, in El Patalia, and it's also the Julian Roebuck are involved in that. So those two cars coming to blows, but they will get, they both look as though they've got back underway, even with a little bit of damage as a result of that. But down towards the complex for the first time, we're looking around the outside, is Charlie Lower for the lead on Harry George. And also in there watching on is car 71, which is Giles Perry. He started third, but going good to Will with Gareth Lucas and Tom Noakes. So already, so frantic battles at the front, but this is the great thing. They're learning, they you watch them learn and develop before our eyes. And so that's a quite a frantic start, but, they, but you can tell from when they start in the seat to where they are now. They've learned a lot in those races that they've run to be able to get a clean start towards the front, pick their way through in the opening lap and survive it so they can settle in to try and pick off the battles that they want to get position. But now they've got to learn where can you overtake? Where is it important to defend? This again is something new for them. They've done testing, they've been out of qualifying, they've not raced a crop before. So uh, the top two, Harry George, Charlie Lower, they're nose to tail. But Charlie will be thinking, right, OK, where can I actually attack for the race lead? Well, apparently, into the complex is somewhere that he can attack because he's all over the back of Harry George as they wind their way through here into the hairpin and back out the other side. The safety car, I think, was just on standby there in case we uh, needed it for this first corner shunt. But I think both of those cars managed to drag themselves out of the way. So it pulls into the pit lane. The field continues on its way. Harry George will lead the opening lap of the race there. Second place is lower, but look at Giles Perry. He's really closed in on them in the second half of that lap. They were further ahead of him, I think, as they went through tower half a lap ago, and he is now starting to close back in on those top two. George and lower start really scrapping, and Giles will be well and truly a part of that fight. Absolutely. So out through the S's then for the second time. A little slide, I think, for Harry George, and that will certainly give the opportunity for um, Charlie Lowe to try and make a move. He's going to put himself wide outside. Oh, goodness me, there's been an incident up at uh, Hawthorns. Two cars are off in the barriers, and another one came across on the incident and sideswiped the front of the car that went off. So that will certainly be at least a safety car. If not, I presume possibly a red flag, because there are two cars that are stranded up at Hawthorns. So that I think will be at least a safety car that to clear them up. If not, they'll have to stop this race, I think. So that's uh, it. That's the kind of downside of uh, the rookie drivers, of, of like these guys in their first seasons, that unfortunately there are points when you have to find the limit, and unfortunately when you do find that limit, sometimes you overstep it a little bit too much, and stuff like that can happen, but it's all part of being a racing driver, just unfortunate that some of these drivers that get caught, caught up in that incident when they were hoping for a clean race to get through, but sadly, some of these drivers uh, haven't quite had the stuff start they had, and as we predicted, Andy, red flag, which is no surprise, so it's unfortunate, but again, you have to remember, these are rookie drivers, they're learning as they go, so you don't get through a rookie season without making one or two incidents, no matter how big or small. So that's just part and parcel of motorsport. 
Uh, it is, absolutely. It looked like it was the uh, 13 of Robert Beek that was pointing the wrong way up there at Hall, but we've also had the 19 of Chris Roberts recovering, uh, and I think that was Alan Bateman, number 23, that I saw going down the back straight. That is, oh, there's another one, isn't there? Number 64 is Richard Lawrence. So 13, Robert Beek there with the damage to the left front. Uh, Lawrence's car in the background pointing the wrong way as well. Tricky part of the circuit, that, though, because you're mm. fully committed into Hawthorne, and from these sort of low-slung single-seaters, you probably can't see far around Hawthorne as you commit to it because they've got that big tyre stack on the apex. If you're surrounded by other cars especially, you will have no idea if someone's spun in front of you, and as they then come across the outside of the road to try and get out of the way, that does unfortunately put them right on the racing line. So uh, it's not an uncommon incident, and unfortunately that's been quite an expensive one by the looks of it. Lots of damaged cars. Uh, and a number of them, I think, will be heading straight for the pit lane now to try and get their uh, uh, kind of the repair work started. Uh, although whether they'll be able to get into the resumption of the race, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, the main thing is, I think the drivers were all out of the cars. There's a lot of fluid on the track look up at uh, Clairvaux. Now, that's actually before where the incident was. I noticed there's some fluid through the uh, complex just behind us as well. So I think that might have been from the lap one incident, maybe, um, because I did spot one or two cars limping around even then. Yeah, there might be main Anil Patalia or the other car that was involved, which was I think it was the car 77, I think, which was Arnold. So, uh, no, sorry, it was it, it was um, it was either Ro I think it was either Roebuck or Patalia that was had the uh, had the fluid that's gone down. I think you're I think you're absolutely right. The content that they have means that there's possibly some fluid going around. There was also a car that was going slower towards the back, and that was the 77 of Lyndon Arnold. So, I think he must have got involved in something as well. But uh, unfortunate to see, but uh, the main thing is is that uh, all the drivers that are involved in the incident are at least able to get out of the car of their own power, and that's the main, main concern, because of course um, that's, the main, that's the main thing in any kind of incident. So the cars have been pulled onto the grid. Now, because they haven't completed two racing laps when the red flag came out, they will grid them up in their original qualifying order, which means that uh, Harry George and Charlie Lowe will be back on the front row of the grid together. So anyone that lost positions... It, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, but anyone that gained positions on the first couple of laps is going to have to go back to where they started originally and do it all over again. And at the same time, it's a saving grace for those who lost positions, because if you lost places on that first lap, you get to start back higher up where you were before. So there's two sides to it, depending on your situation on those open couple of laps, but ultimately, it's a chance for these guys to take two, take a breather and to give it another go after what was a very energetic first lap and a half to get these guys underway. And it gives a chance just to breathe, let some of that adrenaline flow out a little bit and then calm down a bit until they get back up racing again because that's all about it once you get in that first couple of laps when you're when you're in the pack you can feel everything's pumping and it means that you're really sort of on edge trying to get yourself around the pack but it gives you a chance just to calm a little bit and just to make just reset and go again and hopefully keep themselves out of trouble this time uh, yes yeah. So, the uh, car's then gridding back up again for this uh, race restart. The top four runners, actually, were in the uh, exact same order they were running in at the time, uh, at the start of the race. So, George Lower, Perry and Lucas Ready. didn't really gain any ground or lose any. You have to go back to Tom Noakes in fifth place Ready, uh, uh, to find someone that did lose a couple of spots. He was running seventh at the time of the red flag. So, uh, he, of all people, I think, will be quite happy to uh, get a, a restart and uh, get a second opportunity at this. They're already gridding the cars up as well, so I think... Um, the anticipation is that this isn't going to take too long to uh, get the uh, race back underway. So uh, waiting for the recovery work to be done. And this gives us a good opportunity, doesn't it, to um, thank our very hard-working volunteer marshals who are um, hard at work out there. And uh, without them, we couldn't enjoy this sort of uh, motor racing. And they've done a fantastic job. All weekend long, they had a, a couple of incidents to deal with, haven't they, uh, over the course of the weekend, and they've dealt with them uh, as uh, as well and efficiently as we'd expect them to. Absolutely, uh, and we can't ever fault our Orange Army. They do a fantastic job. We, ha we have to remember, of course, in that sequence that, as you see them, hard at work here to clearing up the incident up at Hawthorns, and that's a good sight to see that all the drivers involved are at least walking around the, uh, with, with, with helmets off out of the cars and appear to be on the surface okay. Any incident, they'll always go to the medical centre to go and 
have to be checked over by the, the chief medical officer and their team to make sure that they are A-OK -okay after they after any incident having big or small. Bit of a clear-up as well going on to try and make sure the entire circuit's cleared up. A couple of the uh, maintenance and recovery teams out there to kind of clear up any debris or any fluid that's on the car after it's uh, after the impacts. But yeah, absolutely. The Orange Army are, for me, in terms of marshals, they are the best in the world, genuinely, because they're so well trained, they get refresher training every year or so. They really do get so much training, they get all the different techniques that are put in the mix, different new techniques and new training methods and new kind of procedures that have to be trained on as well. They all get taught them every single year, they get refreshed to make sure they're up to date. And the quality of marshalling in the UK is so good that they get invited not just places like the British Grand Prix, but to further afield events in Europe and America, even as far as Abu Dhabi for the Grand Prix over there. That just shows how quality how much quality there is within British marshalling talent in terms of those who are come on these weekends. I know we say it every single time, but it really is true. Without the marshals and all of our volunteers and officials and those who give it their time to be here, genuinely, these meetings can't happen. They really can't happen because they are a vital part. They are, it's a, it's, it's a thing which is said often, but it's, it's never a true word said. They are the lifeblood of race meetings and the motorsport in the UK. And without them, we wouldn't be sitting here talking at a race meeting because it just simply wouldn't be happening. Yeah, most definitely, and uh, we, uh, as I said, are eternally grateful for uh, all of the hard work that they do and will continue to do, I'm sure. They're stood out there in all weathers. Uh, thankfully, this weekend, it's been pretty pleasant, but uh, they're just as enthusiastic, sort of, uh, even if it is wet and windy and cold out there, which uh, has been known on uh, the odd occasion in, uh, in British motorsport. I uh, couldn't help but smile to myself just then. We got a great shot of the uh, cars on the grid uh, from the pit wall, I think, and... Um, a lot of the drivers, not all of them, but a lot of them uh, are using the opportunity. These cars, of course, all carrying um, a registration uh, plates <laughs> and uh, using that as an opportunity to tell everyone what their nicknames are. Now, whether they came up with these nicknames themselves or whether it's what the other drivers call them, I'm not too sure, but there were some uh, particularly amusing ones that I uh, spotted out there. And uh, that sort of does indicate doesn't it the fun and enjoyable nature of getting involved in caterham racing because it is a big racing family and, and because drivers tend to stay in the caterham motorsport family for year after year after year after year they get to know each other and then they actually become really quite close over the years and uh, the longer that they continue racing the better they get to know each other and you do get that real camaraderie as you walk through the paddock and as i was doing so earlier on this afternoon they're all laughing and joking they're all meeting up having a cup of coffee with each other and uh, talking about their racing exploits and it's just a really really nice paddock to be a part of yeah absolutely and the great thing is is that what it also does is it it the more they race with each other, the more it instills trust between a particular group of drivers. And that's why you generally tend to see a group of academy drivers that are kind of the front runners that will come through with it's a, a, a collective of drivers. Because in every academy, academy season, you get one or two drivers that will drop off and just do the season or then go and race elsewhere. Or they'll say, right, I've had my fun racing in the academy. I'm going to move away and take a break or go do something else. But the core drivers that stick on from the, stay on from the academy genuinely stick together and they do tend to go up together as a collective through road sport, then through 270R, then through 310R, and then steadily there's a there's a, uh, a bit of a drip feed of drivers that will move up into the top ranks or stay in 310R for a while or move on to a different challenge. But that's the great thing in terms of when you enter the Caterham Academy, you genuinely make friends, I won't give you for life, because you, or at least for your duration within Caterham racing circles. And I've known there are several drivers that I know I've been friends with who have been part of the same, well, I know from Paddocks, have been part of the same uh, academy group from the last uh, that started back in the academy in the last five six seven eight years and occasionally one will go off and do something else and come back and race and you get that collective of drivers and that's where it instills that trust in the drivers when they're racing wheel to wheel it means that they know when they're racing together they can run close they can run just that far away from you know from coming into contact but they can do it clean without a wing going off somewhere or a contact with someone hitting someone in the back it's only in extreme circumstances when that happens so that just shows how close the drivers are and also how well suit well knitted the driver how close knit each academy group tends to be as it goes up the ranks and then after all the same planet together usually some drivers in one championship will stay on and watch other championships because they've got friends in other steps of the Caterham ladder so it really is one big collective and Caterham do make sure that it is a proper family atmosphere they have you know the, 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 the lunch they put on every weekend they have panic parts in the evening as well where they get the drivers together and have a drink and a laugh and some food it's it really is a proper weekend a proper like racing weekend away where you get to do it with your mates it's I heard someone like in race meetings it's kind of like it's like a I forgive the slightly sort of gender-based term, but it's kind of a bit like um, a, a spa day out for men in many cases, where you get you get told where to go, you get told what to do, you get the, the benefit of having a race car that's pretty much mostly put together for yourself. You go and race and enjoy yourself. You pay several hundred pounds, and then you go home again. It's, it's, very, very, it's a little bit similar to that in terms of cases. I heard that term, and 
something to that effect. It's kind of it's it's not far from that truth. These guys really do come here just to have fun, to enjoy themselves with their friends, and ultimately live out any fancy their ambitions of being a racing driver. And that's something which, in some cases, while it might be a monetary cost to it, the memories that will create from that. It's cheesy to say it, I know, but are genuinely priceless. It's fantastic. You get the memories and the friendships that carry on, not just whilst they're racing, but beyond that as well. Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, if it's not fun, there isn't really much point in doing it, is there? So uh, it, that is definitely the ethos that uh, Caterham go for when uh, putting these championships together. And they continue to be run uh, extremely well indeed. Uh, whilst we've been waiting for the uh, restart to happen, which I think is imminent now, the recovery work appears to be completed now up at Hawthorne. I did spot that uh, Julian Roebuck, who was involved in that initial shunt at Turn 1, his car has been pushed off the grid now uh, and down the pit lane. So he doesn't look like he's going to be taking the restart there it is look going down the pit lane uh, there's another car actually just ahead of it can't quite see the number on that one but uh, the uh, 74 car most definitely will not be taking the start of the race then or the restart of the race have we had a notification yet as to how long it's going to be oh, over the full 20 minutes so it's going to be a full 20 minute restart we must be running ahead of time for once and uh, that means that we have got time to get the, uh, the full 20 minutes of racing action in which is the right thing to do. It's the only race this weekend that the Academy drivers had. They paid their money. They want to get their money's worth. And so uh, giving them the full uh, the full race distance is absolutely the right way to go, especially since we hadn't, uh, well, we were a lap and a half into the race, weren't we, really, when we got the, uh, got the red flag coming out. So uh, it is going to be Harry George on that pole position, Charlie Lower alongside him. Just 73 one thousandths of a second between those two in qualifying earlier on today. Giles Perry was a further tenth and a bit back. Uh, and then those three really had quite a pace advantage over the rest of the field. Gareth Lucas, fourth, was a full second further back. So the top three we expect to make a little bit of a break here. And uh, as the green flag lap gets underway, we are now uh, just one lap away from the resumption of the race. And uh, there you can see the uh, some of the midfield winners going through. Number 50 is Neil Perry, for example. Uh, it will be a slightly thinner grid then, unfortunately, that will, uh, that will take the restarted race. Three different winners so far this year, five different drivers that have been on the podium, and um, that's pretty impressive given the fact we've only had six events, five of them races, one of them that uh, sprint at Kerber at the uh, start of the season. It has been a very competitive season in the uh, Caterham Academy White Championship and uh, yeah, wouldn't be at all surprised to see a few new drivers. Giles Perry, for example, looking for his first podium and he's had podium pace so far this weekend. So uh, another example, I think, of a driver coming on strong in the latter part of the season. And that's the great thing is that through the season, drivers will develop at different rates. And so some drivers where they've been a little bit off the pace initially or they've been a little bit sort of tentative in getting started in the racing. Once they find their feet and find their confidence, really it could be you know, just a good result or even a good qualifying that. It's incredible how much that one small thing like a good lap or even a good apex in the corner or something could just spark a bit more confidence and therefore it's almost like flicking a switch. Some drivers will go from being more tentative, a bit more careful, a bit more cautious to then getting their elbows out a bit more, feeling a bit more confident, having the car properly underneath them, being able to really push on and be able to get some strong results. And they can have a really good start second half of the season that then sets them up for going forwards into road sport onwards. And then one thing is also notable is that some drivers will adapt and be favoured different stages of the coach and road sport ladder where some drivers will thrive for example in the academy and road sport then when they start to go into track sport with a different suspension track sport, that's old name 270R and 310 with the newer suspension the upgrades that come in and the extra power sometimes it doesn't really work in their favor and it can be vice versa some drivers struggle in the academy and road sport then they start to find their feet with the newer suspension the upgrades in 270 and 310 so different part stages of the, the road sport ladder can cater to different drivers it's amazing how in one series, they can be a little bit uh, sort of off the pace a bit, but then in higher levels, they can be straight on there. So it really is a bit of a difference depending on experience or just preference on how the car feels. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it can be quite a big step up as well when you uh, do move out of academy into road sports, then particularly from road sports, as you said, into 270Rs. That's quite a step up. And again, some take to it pretty quickly. For others, it, uh, it comes a bit more slowly to them. But uh, there's definitely some talent on this academy grid. There always is. Uh, and I have to say, it's testament to Caterham that they're able to get uh, around 20 plus cars on each of the two academy grids. That's 40 to 50 rookie drivers every season. I don't know where they keep finding them, but uh, amongst them, there are always some really, really talented ones. 
can't disagree with that. There are some brilliant drivers who do go on to some pretty brilliant things. We're about to see them do even more here in this restart, the full restart for the 20 minutes of the Love Cars Cage from Academy White Group. So Harry George and Tori Lowe will get to take two for their run down towards turn one. Let's see who wins the whole shot this time. It's a better start from the inside of the front row from Tori Lowe. Great start, in fact, a poor start from Harry George. He got jumped as well from the second row by both, I think, Giles Perry and also from that second row of the grid, it was. Um, Gareth Lucas. Yeah, Gareth Lucas, yeah, as well as they turn into turn one. A couple of cars again running wide over the gravel. They just managed to track their way through. So they seem to have got through relatively unscathed again. There's in the uh, uh, next to the car 97, I think it's James Mooney's car 70. That's uh, Richard J. Ainscoe. And there has been a Richard Ainscoe before. They are related, but he goes by the nickname Rocco Ainscoe. So Rocco Ainscoe in car 78. Watch for him in the top 10. Down towards the complex at Tower for the first time. And Charlie Lower does leave, but down back up the inside of Gareth Lucas. There it goes. The, uh, yeah, goes the white car with the blue stripes of Harry George in towards town for the first time. And it's Charlie Lowe who has to jump. And that was all due to effectively Harry George not getting the start he got the first time around. And it was advantage Charlie Lowe with a great getaway from the front row of the grid. And as they come back towards the back end of the circuit, it's now George doing the chasing rather than being the other way around. And Lower has the clear air going through the right hand of the complex of, of Sunny In and Sunny Out. Yeah, luckily for Harry George, though, he was able to get back into second place before Charlie had sort of escaped up the road. Once Charlie had broken the toe, he might not have been easy to catch given how uh, equal their pace was in qualifying these two. So uh, for our sake, good news because it means we've still got a race on our hands. Harry George is definitely not going to want to let uh, Charlie uh, get away here at the front of the field. So it is the 21 car then of Charlie Lower that leads the way. Both of them running very wide there through the right-hand element of the complex. On screen there we were seeing Giles Perry, who is fighting for his first podium in the category here. And he's about to be dropped, uh, dumped down in the top four now, I think. As on the inside of him there, coming out of the hairpin, comes the number eight car of Tom Noakes. So Giles, uh, Giles Perry's second start, not quite as strong as his first. A couple of them actually struggling with that, weren't they? Uh, perhaps having uh, put the tyres through another heat cycle a little bit. Maybe it wasn't quite as easy to get the car off the line. But uh, at the end of the first lap, it is almost a one-second advantage then from Lower to George. So he's almost broken the toe, hasn't he? Almost, and he's certainly trying to get it, give it a go as he comes out through the S's and onto the back straight. So he has got that gap, and again, he's, the photo can pull away, but less effective the toe will be, if at all, for Harry George. We're looking here at the uh, car number eight, which is Tom Noakes. He's in fifth position in the top five, just behind John Perry as they come back down. There's a big move here up the inside of that. It's Benja Headley going up the inside of 42. Michael Banton, someone else behind, who's way out of shape, out of spin, just behind them. Uh, it was just off camera, but I saw them getting all crossed up and out of shape. Uh, I, do you know what? I almost want to say that's possibly Rocco Ainsco it might have been, but uh, I'll have to wait and see. The, the girl I have to play with that is spot the car that goes tumbling down the timing stream when they come past next time by. So we'll see who that was that had that spin, but he was way out of control. The car was all moving around in the background trying to get it stopped. So uh, it wasn't quite the way he wanted to go through Tower Bend, but he's managed to get it going back in the right way. So in through, sunny in and sunny out they go. Still Michael Banton now ahead of uh, Benja Headley in that blue car number 99. Just behind him is car 20, Mark Janiszewski. That's a scrap going on for sixth down to eighth as the leaders come back into the complex. It's still Charlie Lowe that leads it then. It's then Harry George in second. 43 is Gareth Lucas. 71 is Giles Perry in the kind of the silver car with the fluorescent yellow uh, wheel trim and the fluorescent yellow roll bars. Fifth place is Tom Noakes. Sixth now is Michael Banton. It's Headley and Jazeski in there as well. Here comes Banton trying to make a move on Noakes as they get the drag race down towards turn one again at the start of that three. Uh, first proper flying lap goes to the fastest lap of the race goes to Harry George. Only fractionally faster than uh, Charlie Lower on that last lap. It was a 138.6 for Lower, 138.5 for George. So big slide there also just in front. That was for uh, Charles Perry, I think. He's trying to make up some moves. No, sorry, that's um, Michael Banton who's going all over the place there. He's got past Tom Noakes into Claire, but in Clairvaux, but through Hawthorns, all out of shape. And now he's got just Tom Noakes and Benja Headley and Mark Jones actually chasing him down. And that's not a sign you want in your with three cars bearing down on you in the back, down the back straight. Uh, down towards Tower they come then, which is the spot at which Simon Patel got it wrong a lap ago. He was the spinner uh, under braking into the right-hander. He has uh, rejoined, but all the way down in 12th place, lost a couple of places. As a result of that, sideways out of the right-hander. 10-second penalty, meanwhile, for car number 78. That is uh, Richard Ainsco, who we were just talking about. 10-second um, penalty this early in the race has to be something to do with the start procedure, either a jump start or an out-of-position start. Uh, they haven't done enough laps for him, surely, to have picked up a 10-second track limit 
penalty. If he has, that's some good going in a way, but uh, no, I'm pretty sure that will be something amiss uh, with his uh, star procedure, which is, is a bit of a shame. Fastest lap then to Harry George, but only fractionally quicker, wasn't he? About uh, three and a half hundredths of a second quicker than Charlie Lower. So, again, going to show just how evenly matched these two are. There was less than a tenth of a second between them in qualifying, and it looks similar now, although I'd say, Scott, as they come towards the end of this lap, the gap is a bit smaller than that. Yeah, definitely. If you look at it visible on the camera, if you see it on the shot, he's definitely close, and he will get close on the, on the run down to towards Clairvaux on the run to try and get towards turn one quickest. Uh, in behind them for third place, as Harry George now sets another new fast lap of the race. He was six tenths quick on that last lap, so that confirms the pace that he's got. Uh, just, he's now got a, quite a gap, 1.8 seconds now over uh, Gareth Lucas in third position. Charles Perry is close with him, about seven tenths back in fourth. We're looking here at uh, Tom Noakes backing away with the 20 car of Mark Janizewski, Benja Headley's in there as well, and Michael Banton, who was at the head of this group uh, literally a lap ago, is now at the back of it. So it's all changed around again with Noakes in fifth position, Janizewski sixth, Headley seventh, and Michael Banton, who was down to in eighth position, now back down to fifth, is now at the inside for Malikos, Harry George into tower, but sticking around the outside is Charlie Lowe, he's gonna try and hold on as much as he can. Charles Perry, meanwhile, has gone to third up the inside of uh, 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 Gareth Lucas, also what's going on behind him as well. This is the battle fifth to eighth, and then Benji Heddy came out of that, but there's a big cloud of dust and all sorts was going on there. It's kind of everyone tried to be fifth at the first at the same point at the same corner, and it just didn't work out for any of them. Yeah, one of them dived up the inside. It was possibly Janozewski, and then he got it all wrong coming through the apex, almost clattered into the side of the car to his outside. Miraculous, they all kept going, and I don't think there was ever any contact. Oh, that was car in the barriers, and that's down at Hawthorne's by the looks of it. So that's the second time we've had drama there. Now who that is, that is. I was about to say it might be it might be Louise Deeson I was about to say because um, I was going to take a small guess at that. Um, as now we see the leaders come back into the complex. I was watching this battle that's still going on here for fourth and fifth position. I fear though, with the position where that car is, it might well be a, a safety car, which it is. Safety car has been deployed. The RunYourFleet.com Jaguar safety car is out on track, and that means for the I think literally the first time, no, not the first time today, but the first time in a catering race today, the safety car is out. Yeah, I think you might be right with that, actually. So the uh, runyourfleet.com Jaguar safety car, which I got a ride in this morning, actually, finally, after yeah. asking all season long. Very impressive, very comfortable. Even got to turn the lights on and off. I was like being a kid again. Uh, anyway, uh, point is, very nice car and uh, nice to have it here and nice to have runyourfleet.com uh, supporting the BRSCC once again, the, or for the first time this season, I should say, uh, which is we don't like seeing safety cars. We, uh, runyourfleet.com. Jaguar safety car has definitely attracted a lot of attention this season. It's back out on track now, then leading the field past the incident zone there through Hawthorne. And uh, hopefully this won't take too long. It's just one car that needs to be removed. So uh, we would hope that could be quite a quick recovery. What does this mean for the race then? Well, not a huge amount for the top two, really, because uh, Lower and George were battling away for the lead anyway, weren't they? Um, what it does do is it allows Sir Giles Perry, who has just taken that third place back away from Gareth Lucas, to close back in on them. So uh, we know that Giles, in qualifying, at least had the pace to go with those top two, but he'd just become detached from them in the early stages after not a, a brilliant restart. So now he gets a, another bite at the cherry here to maybe not only try and get that first podium of the season, but maybe challenge for his first win. Yeah, and just to confirm as well, sadly, uh, it was, it was, uh, we suspect it was Louise Deeson that went off. It is Louise Deeson because the only other car that's running, it hasn't crossed the line yet, is David Saxby, who I think is running at a, a reduced pace for some reason, uh, for whatever reason. It's just running, he's running slower towards the start of the race anyway. There's not really any, any evident damage on the back of the car, but uh, there is Louise walking back, sadly. So, uh, uh, her weekends come to a premature end after the restart, after the, the short, uh, was it one lap, and then she only lasted, I think it was for the, the four laps that we did until she uh, sadly hit the barriers. So, but she's walk, she's still walking on her own steam, that's the main thing. She'll go to the medical centre as well just to make sure that he, she is perfectly okay, get quickly checked over by the chief medical officer for this weekend. So, quick check on the order then, just to kind of confirm where we are then. So, Charlie Lower then leads the race uh, with, haven't hit halfway yet, we've still got 11 and a quarter minutes to go in this white group race for the Love Cars Catering Academy. Uh, Harry George is second, from Giles Perry in third, Gareth Lucas is fourth, and Benja Headley rounds out the top five at this point in time. Sixth is Michael Banton, seventh is Mark Janazewski, eighth is Tom Noakes, he slipped back from what was fifth at that point after that huge melee up at Tower Bend. Then it's ninth place for uh, another one of the Perrys, car 50, that is Neil Perry, so there's two drivers in Perry. I don't know if they're related, but uh, Neil Perry in car 50 is currently in fifth ninth position. Then, then it's uh, the number 97 car, James Moon in P10. Uh, and it's Simon Patel in 11th place. Uh, Rocco Ainsco, who's got that 10-second penalty for, we believe, a jump start. Uh, um, 
because we had the information come up on the screen just briefly. Then it's uh, the 55 of Graham Walker, who's currently in 13th place. 14th is Carl 23, which is Alan Bateman, and then David Sachs, who's running at that reduced pace for some particular reason in this race. He's been lapping at least well, even behind the car that's just in front of him, eight, ten seconds off the pace, which is rather odd, I thought. But um, he's back at 15th pace, and the last car was still running because, as we see, Louise Deeson sadly has uh, retired from the race, but she's still walking around up her case. That's the main thing. She's here. She appears to be okay, but she will get checked over just to make sure. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, Louise then our first uh, retirement, well, not first retirement, first retirement of the restarted race then, but uh, at least you can watch the race, of the rest of the race unfold from up at Clairvaux, which is a brilliant place to uh, uh, go and watch the racing. Uh, there's a grandstand up there, which a lot of spectators have been making use of, and uh, provides a brilliant view of uh, basically the entire first half of the circuit, but certainly uh, that opening complex of corners where there's always drama, and uh, that's uh, certainly proved to be the case today. We've got uh, nine and a half minutes to go then, and uh, the field being led by Charlie Lower then, who at the moment is set to outscore Harry George. And so provisionally move into the points lead then, I presume. It's going to be uh, interesting to see how the drop scores are affected by William James's absence, of course. Uh, but certainly Harry and Charlie uh, will move ahead of him on total points. Uh, which way round they are, though, awaits to be seen. There have been uh, two victories each for those two, Harry and Charlie. Harry uh, took his at Knock Hill and Brands Hat, whereas Charlie was a winner at Kerber in the sprint. And then got his first race win at Silverstone uh, a few weeks ago, a month or so ago now. Uh, but as far as consistency is concerned, Harry George has had the more consistent season because as well as those two wins, he's also had three third place finishes, whereas Charlie Lowe has been off the podium twice uh, this season, including a, a slightly disappointing seventh place finish, uh, which he had in the first race up at Knock Hill. That's a challenging circuit to learn uh, in, your, uh, in your debut season of racing. So, uh, that, at the moment, is his drop score, whereas uh, Harry George is dropping a few more points, his worst finish being a fifth-place finish at the first race of the season at, uh, at Mallory Park. Giles Perry, as I said, looking for his first podium. He's had a couple of top fives, uh, but yet to finish inside the top three. And uh, this safety car possibly helps his chances of keeping hold of that third place because he was having a really good battle, wasn't he, with Gareth Lucas uh, before the safety car came out. We were enjoying watching it, but I'm sure Charles has been quite grateful having taken that third place that he's been able to have a bit of a breather and, uh, and hopefully consolidate that podium place. Fingers crossed he can. He'll get a chance to do that in a moment's time because the safety car lights are out on the runyourfleet.com Jaguar safety car. There it goes through the shot and it'll make its way back to pit lane. Meanwhile, there is a bit of a gap because it's now Charlie Lowe's turn to resume the role of basically temporary safety car. He now heads the pack and he now decides when to get this race back underway again. He will choose when to pull the pin, put his foot to the floor and get this race back underway. Just on the exit of the other complex, that's when he's gone. So out as a safety car makes his way deep into pit lane, into the hairpin for the restart goes Charlie Lower. A good jump on Harry George, it seems. Charlie's Char trying to go with him on the exit of the hairpin, but Charlie Lower leads the pack across the line and back underway here in the Cation Academy Championship in the white group. So Lower leads, then George in second place, Giles Perry third, Gareth Lucas fourth, and Benja Headley rounding out the top five, Michael Banty sixth, seventh place. Oh, that's a piece of bodywork that came off Charlie Lower's car. I think that's one of his wings came off on that green. I didn't see him clip anything, but again, we know that that exit curve of Sun Yao has been collecting wings, so to speak, when it, of the cars running wide. It's such, that's such a steep drop off the exit of that corner, so I wonder whether he's done that, or I don't think it was contact with anyone, because he didn't have contact with, Charlie, with Harry George, they've been battling, but I don't think they've touched, but either way, at least his cars are a little bit lighter than it was before, not as aerodynamic, but it's a little bit lighter in many cases, but as Lower heads into the right hand at Tower Bend with George on his tail, uh, as it was, although <laughs> commentators curse, wide at the exit of uh, Tower Bend, runs deep, too deep, and straight back to into Harry George. I should probably keep my mouth shut on that six minutes ago, shouldn't I? Because I've just cursed him going out this through Tower Bend. So, yes, Harry George now leads. Charlie Lowe is back on his tail in second place. Giles Perry in third and watching on. But now, lead change on the first half of this restart. And Charlie Lowe will try and get it back as soon as he can. Uh, yeah, this has brought Giles Perry onto their tail as well. I was about to say they were gapping the third place car already, but as they round Sunny now, you can see in the background there, look, the third place man getting away from uh, Gareth Lucas in fourth and trying to chase after the top two, who could be side by side again into the complex here. Up the inside goes Charlie Lower, he's sideways, but off goes the race leader. Oh, I don't believe it. Harry George gets it all wrong coming into the complex. He gets back onto the circuit into third place. That gives the lead back then to Lower. It gives Perry second place, and now he might lose third place as well, uh, going into the hair because diving up the inside there, went to uh, Gareth Lucas, and Lucas is still leaning on him a bit, as they come out of the hair, been banging wheels then, shake of the fist there from uh, Harry George, who's not going to be pleased with any of that, his mistake, or the rather robust driving from um, 
Lucas coming through the hairpin, but all in all, it has dropped him out of the podium places, and that was just a mistake under pressure. The attack came from lower into the complex, and Harry just outbraked himself. And quite ironic, it was mistakes from the top two that lost, not only lost Charlie Lowe the lead, and then a mistake from uh, not long after from Harry George lost him the lead after he'd taken it as a result of Charlie Lowe's mistake. So back in the lead goes Charlie, and now he's got a new pursuer in the, in the, the form of Giles Perry in car 71. As for Harry George, he's trying to get back down the outside of Gareth Lucas, who defends the inside line, but George will try and go around the outside or look for the cutback through Tower Ben. Also trying to close in now is Benja Headley. Good restart for him up to him to fifth position, and he's going to try and squeeze in as well, looking at some of his best results. So they come up through the uh, Jim Clark S's now on this second restart. Benja's best start after he's back at the points. His best finish has been a third place, and that was back at uh, Mallory Park at the season open at the season open for the circuit races. He's to try and get himself a mix. He can get third place if he can work his way past George and then Gareth Lucas and stay close in this second collective as the top two are trying to break away early doors here. You see Lower and Perry trying to pull away now as quickly as possible. There on screen, if you're watching on the stream, is Lucas versus George. They're just off shot. There's going to be Benja Headley just in the mix as well. So top five coming through the complex together. The rest of the top ten has got uh, Banton 6, Janiszewski 7, Noakes, Moon and Perry. Lots of sideways action. Michael Banton's out wide in the background. That's, if you're hearing that sort of on the microphone of the camera, there's cars going sideways all over the place. Rocco Ains going sideways as well. That's off camera. What's watching on here is a bit more tidy battle for third and fourth position. Charlie Lower, now that he's been freed from the pursuit of Harry George, He's pursuing Harry George. He's now got the fastest lap of the race on a 1 minute 38.006. Meanwhile, Gareth Lucas looks back around the outside to defend with third place. Harry George makes it stick. And Gareth Lucas just went too deep, too wide. Two was onto the gravel. A good night, Irene. He's gone. That was never going to work. He could never get that car stopped. And you're on the outside line, which is the dirty side of the road as well. And uh, just so little grip out there. And... Uh, Having fully committed, he was uh, unfortunately only ever going to end up in one place there. Uh, they're just lapping, by the way, the uh, slightly slow uh, car that uh, is at the back of the field. So that's going to be potentially problematic. David Saxby, that was, uh, that the leaders were just negotiating. And as uh, they drop into the right-hander at Tower Corner, there's Tom Noakes. Up ahead, there's a car on the grass. There was another car that seemed to be exiting stage left there, which I think Tom has just overtaken. And then a bit of squeeze going down towards the Jim Clark S's. That's uh, not a nice place to be uh, squeezed onto the grass. It benefited Noakes, though. He got himself up ahead uh, of the 97 of James Moon there. And uh, might have been Janiszewski then that was running wide in the 20 car just ahead of them. I think he's possibly the third car uh, in this group, just out of shot at the moment. So they head through uh, Sunny. The leaders are at the complex then. Leader getting away really now. Charlie Lower certainly seems to have a bit of an advantage over Giles Perry, who's still going to be really happy with second place if he can hang on to it for another two and a half minutes. Uh, the question is though, can the third and fourth place cars close in at all? What can Harry George do as well as far as his pursuit of getting back into the top three? Exactly. He's got quite a gap to make up, and of course the cut, he's got uh, some one point to get the gap to come across the line. So George has 2.2 seconds to make up, but he's going to do it in two minutes and 20 seconds, which I'm not quite certain he's going to be able to do. You spotted something, Mr. McEwen. Yes, because Gareth Lucas hasn't come through on the timing. Uh, he was the one that had the spin at Clairvaux. Uh, yes, yes. that, that was at spinner. least a minute ago. That <laughs> I've forgotten about that already. Yes, you're quite right. So Gareth Lucas has recovered. He's back down the 11th, so he's managed to get back going again. So unscathed, but just the only thing he's hurt is just, it's just his own pride. So uh, meanwhile, we can hear on screen, this is car 20, and that is uh, yeah Janazewski, who's up into fourth place. His best result so far this season has been eight. So if he can get this, it'll be by far his best result. Although Benja Headley might have something to say about that. Up the inside he goes, and up into fourth position he takes. Although Janazewski will try and get him back. So I suspect that... Headley was the one that made the initial mistake. Janiszewski went off a bit in sympathy, and that's brought Headley back in the midst because he was up there with the top three battling with Harry George. So looks like Janiszewski's rolled him back in again, and now they're going to fight over the best of the rest in fourth position. Although, in that sort of sequence, it looked as though that um, Janiszewski backed off a little bit through the Jim Clark S and lost a few car lengths uh, to Benja through the uh, right hander at the at Sunny Inn. A little wide there on the first part of the apex for Sunny Inn, through Sunny Out is much better this time. Not too far away is Michael Banton in sixth, having a strong run. Tom Noakes is also there in seventh. There's the leaders. Charlie Lower holding on from Giles Perry with a minute and four to go. So next time by will be the last lap. Harry George is trying to close back in third place. Then for fourth, fifth and sixth all together. So three cars battling for the lead. Three cars battling for fourth. As they go on to the last lap of the race, one more time around the cross circuit. Let's see if Charlie Lower can hold on or if either Giles Perry or even Harry George can do anything about it on this final lap. 
Uh, yeah, well, the gap uh, between the top two certainly stayed static that time. That's just over a second now between uh, Lower and Perry. And they head through uh, Clervo Corner now. And he's that third, fourth, fifth place battle, isn't it, really? Uh, Headley, Januszewski and uh, Banton then showing in those places. So uh, Harry George then is slipping down the timing screens now. Is that a transponder issue? No, he's still there, isn't he? The 17 a car. Transponder issue, yeah, I think. That's, uh, I thought I'd forgotten something else then, but no, he is definitely still there in third place. It's fourth place that is the battle, and they're side by side as they head down the back straight now. Then defensive line on the inside being taken by Mark Januszewski, uh, but it's not quite going to work as uh, around the outside of them then uh, goes Headley to reclaim that fourth place. The leaders, though, are heading up through the Jim Clark S's for the final time. And I think, Scott, that our podium places are pretty much set now. Yep, this will be, looking on the results from earlier in the season, it will be the uh, second win It will be the uh, second win of the season for China. Though. He won the sprint at Kerber, which was a sprint event rather than a circuit race. He won the race, he won the Porsche. Oh, well, this car has gone wide on the exit of Tower Bed. It's further back, I think, in about the sixth or seventh position. One car also, I think, with a bit of damage further back. But he, he's won the, the sprint race at Kerbera. He also won the uh, white group portion of the Silverstone Grand Prix race on the combined grid. And Charlie Lower, as he turns his way now out through the complex and into the hairpin for the final time, is going to take his second victory, his first standalone race victory, because, of course, it was combined grid at Silverstone. He heads out of the final corner, up to the checkered flag, and victory will go to Charlie Lower in the white group for the Kate Love Cars case from Academy. Cross the line to take the win. Second place in his best results of the season is Giles Perry. That's for Harry George. He'll have to be satisfied with third place. His first third place of the season after he's, fi after he's finished on the podium first and second. Then it's Benja Henley picking up fourth. A season's best result for Mark Janiszewski to take fifth position. He'll be delighted with that. Michael Banton in sixth position. Uh, seventh place for Giles Perry. Sorry, Neil Perry. Eighth for Tom Noakes. Ninth for James Moon. And Simon Patel will round out the top ten. And also, I think Simon Patel was a bit agreed. I think he might have been the, the driver that went off uh, wide at... Tower Bend, finishing in the 10th position. Rocco Ainsco is 11th place. And it's uh, Gareth Lucas, after he had that spin up at Clairvaux battling with Harry George, he will finish in 12th. But it will be Graham Walker, followed by Alan Bateman and David Saxby. He really has been quite off the pace in 15th place for reasons whether it's a, just uh, his own individual pace or whether it's simply just mechanical issues. Either way, not as fast as he would like to have been. But, uh, well done to all of our Cajun Academy drivers for surviving that race. And, they'll, of course, they'll go off for their uh, season finale uh, in terms of their main championship. That will take place uh, at Stetterton, where they will have two races to round off the season. Two more races left to go, both being a double header. And uh, we're going to head to the championship results, to the race results on the stream. So just for the record, for those watching, Charlie Lower then takes the provisional victory here at uh, Croft in the white group for the Cajun Academy. Giles Perry is second, Harry George third, and Benja Headley fourth, and Mark Janiszewski rounds out the top five ahead of Michael Banton, Neil Perry, Tom Noakes, James Moon, and Simon Patel. 11th place for Rocco Ainscoe, then it's Gareth Lucas, Graham Walker, Alan Bateman, and David Saxby. And sadly, from that restarted race, we lost Louise Deason after she went off into the tyres up at Hawthorns. And of course, we lost a few cars from that first start when there was an incident in the first couple of laps.